All right, Biology 11 students, we are back. Today we are gonna be learning about fungi. And so this is the next thing. We're starting to get larger, right, with our groups. We started with bacteria, which were very, very small. Talked about viruses, even though they're not considered living things entirely. Got into protists, which are eukaryotic cells, bigger than bacteria. And now we're getting into the multicellular stuff, the stuff that you can actually see, which is a little bit easier to kind of conceptualize in some ways. So again, this is our PowerPoint lecture note that is on your D2L page. And this is the board that I'll be writing on to, uh, to help out you know, with the explanation of this stuff here. So let's get into this. We're dealing with fungi. And we'll look at the characteristics of fungi first. I'll bring them all up. So all fungi are eukaryotic heterotrophs. Eukaryotic means they have all the organelles, a nucleus that holds their DNA is a big thing there, and they're the larger type of cell. We've talked about that before you know what those are. A heterotroph is something that has to eat something else. It, it doesn't make its own energy like a plant would, right? If you lay a fungi out in the sun, it's not going to do anything. It needs to eat something else. It can't make its own food. Um, they are saprobes. And what saprobes are is basically they, they eat dead and decaying matter around them, right? Dead bodies of animals and insects and that that are in the, you know, and plants that are in the soil. And what they do is they release enzymes. And the enzymes break down the food around them and then they suck it in like a milkshake sort of, you know, sort of thing. So that's what they do. Um, they, the process of absorbing that material is called endocytosis. The bodies of most fungi are made of these little filaments, these little threads called hyphae. Hyphae are a big player in fungi. We're gonna be talking about hyphae a lot today. And what happens is the hyphae grow when you get, you know, the fungus starts to grow and more and more hyphae get together and eventually a whole bunch of hyphae forms a mycelium. Now the mycelium is what you th are thinking of when you think of a fungus. A common fungus would be like a mushroom. So you think of mushroom kind of growing like that, right, in the ground. This is the mycelium. And if we could magnify it a whole lot, we'd see little thread-like filaments making it up everywhere. Microscopic threads. Those are the hyphae. So a whole bunch of these make one of these, and this is what I can see. This is my mushroom or my fungus, all right? They have cell walls just like plants. We used to think these were plants, but they have cell walls just like plants. And the cell walls are not made of cellulose like a plant has. It's made of chitin. It looks like chitin, but chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. So it's a different material that makes up the cell wall of a fungus as opposed to a plant. Now, this is the probably the toughest part of this lesson is the reproductive life cycle of, of fungi. So I'm gonna go over a common mushroom. Now there are little nuances to different species of fungi that can be different than what I'm gonna tell you here, but this is kind of the basic mushroom. We're not gonna to go too deep into fungi. This is gonna be it. Now, fungi can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Either way, whether it's through sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction, they are going to be using spores, all right? All a spore is, a spore is a cell that can eventually grow and undergo mitosis and become an adult. That's all it is. So it's a reproductive spore that takes hold somewhere and then a whole bunch of mitosis the cell doubles and doubles and doubles till you get an adult from that single cell. All right? So that's what a spore is. And both the sexual and asexual methods of reproduction of fungi use spores. All right? So what happens is our adult, and I'll draw this after we go over the slide, the adult releases spores. The adult is that mushroom. So think of the mushroom growing in the ground. That's your adult fungi. 
it releases spores. These spores drop to the ground or they can be carried away, you know, distance from the adult by the wind. And that single spore, that single cell, starts to grow a hypha. It starts to become a hypha. So it's the single cells like that and it starts to grow the first filament or strand of cells. And this is the hypha that came from the first spore. These strands will grow and grow and grow and multiply just like we said before and eventually when there's a whole lot of them they'll form the mycelium another adult fungus. All right. So obviously just like what we talked about in genetics the asexual way of doing things doesn't give you any increased genetic variation. Things stay the same so whatever the parent fungus was the offspring will be exactly like that. The sexual reproductive way does give you different options genetically in your offspring. So the offspring will be different genetically than the parents. And there's a reason why fungi would go with one over the other and we'll get to that in just a moment. All right. And usually what happens here is when we gain variation, you're thinking, well, if this is just going through mitosis and it's the same thing over and over again, we're not going to get any variation here. So what happens in the sexual reproductive method is one of these strands from one mushroom meets up with another strand from another mushroom. And we'll draw that out in just a second. Now, this diagram right here, I'm not big on it. I don't like this diagram. Um, I know I put it in there and I put it in there a few years back. It made sense to me. And then as I started going over it with students, I realized this is not the best diagram. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to go back. I'm going to draw a diagram here with you that I think is a lot easier than that one. I thought that one was easy, but of course I know this stuff a little bit better than you. So we'll go through and we'll get a diagram that is a lot better. So the first thing we're going to start with is, and I'll move this out of the way for this diagram. The first thing we're going to start with is the mycelium and again we said the mycelium right that is like the the mushroom right so I'll draw a little mushroom there right now an interesting thing about the mushroom the mushroom is a haploid right it only has one full set of chromosomes so to show that we just use an N right me and you, we are diploid organisms. So there would be a two in front of this N, but a mushroom is actually a haploid. Our haploid cells are sperm cells and egg cells. This adult has all haploid cells inside of it. Now, the first way we're gonna do it is the asexual way. So the asexual way, if you look at the underside of a mushroom, there's a series of gills here, and that's where the spores are made. So what happens is spores are produced and the spores are haploid as well, right? And they're made in the gills of the parent plant. All right? The spores are exactly the same genetically as the cells that produce them inside of the parent plant, right? So this is going to give me the exact same thing. This is a reproductive cell. It's going to give me the exact same thing as this. And so what happens is the spores are released. See, they drop out of here like this. They go into the ground and they start to grow. They start to undergo mitosis. Right? And what will happen is the spore will start to grow the hypha, which are the strands, and those two are haploid, 1N, or one set of chromosomes. And so this is our asexual method. Now, why would a fungus go asexually? Well, there's no genetic variation. And we know genetic variation helps us survive you know, those curveballs that Mother Nature could throw at us, like, oh, like a pandemic. Anyway, this thing 
will go asexual when life is good. When conditions are great, there's no challenge. Pah, survival, easy, no problem. We'll do this way. This way allows the mushroom to reproduce very, very quickly. And since life is good and environmental conditions are awesome, we can flourish very, very quickly. All right? Now, the other way is the sexual way. If we're going asexual when life is good, the sexual way that we'll put on this side of the board is going to be when life is challenging, when environmental conditions maybe aren't all that great. All right? So what happens here is the mycelium here, the mushroom, it has hyphae that grow. Right? It's in the ground, and there are hyphae that stretch out from it. So I'm going to draw that here. All right? Now the hyphae of this plant, or this plant of this mushroom, will look like that. And here's, again, the nucleus inside of it. And we know that that is a haploid strand. So this is a hypha of this mushroom right here. All right? As it's growing underneath the ground, it will run into a hypha from another mushroom. So another strand of cells And what will happen is, one of the hypha, this is a hypha from another mushroom, and it's haploid, 1N, one of the hypha strands will release pheromones. Now, pheromones are chemicals that uh, you might have heard of animals using pheromones when it's mating season, right? One of the sexes of the animals will give off this pheromone that says, hey, it's time to mate, it's time to reproduce, right? Same sort of thing happens here. As the hypha is extending underneath the ground, it will release pheromones. And that will tell the other hypha to form a bridge between the two. So what we'll see is a bridge that forms between these two hypha. And what will happen is the nuclei of one of these hypha will be put inside of a, the same cell as the nucleus of another hypha. So the green strand and the pink strand fuse. And what we end up with are a series of cells that will grow off of this, and maybe I'll use orange to show the fuse cells, a series of cells that will grow off of this that have two of these haploid nuclei in them. So each of these cells is gonna have a pink nucleus, and each of these cells is going to have a green nucleus. And this new strand, which is created from the fusion of these two, the term that is used to describe it is heterokaryotic. Heterokaryotic, hetero means different. We have two different nuclei. And a karyotype, if you remember, was a picture of the chromosomes inside of the cell. So heterokaryotic means I've got DNA from two different strands inside of this, right? And what's going to happen inside of this strand, I'll draw it in orange, is now the nuclei will fuse and form one nucleus. So inside of this strand, Eventually, what will happen is these two nuclei will fuse and form one nucleus. I'll use the orange color and draw it bigger to show that. All right? And so what forms there is a zygote. All right? And a zygote is a diploid. It is 2N. All right? So now we have one full set of chromosomes from the pink strand, another full set of chromosomes from the green strand, they have fused together. So 
one n plus another n gives me two n. So these are diploid. All right. The process of the nuclei fusing, fusing is called karyogamy. Uh, right? Gamy means marriage or, or to get together. And karyo, of course, means the chromosomes. So the chromosomes from the two sources, the pink source and the green source, get together here. And then what happens is this will undergo meiosis. Now humans undergo meiosis. When humans undergo meiosis, cells in the testes or ovaries that are diploid will go through meiosis and form, well, if you're female, egg cells. If you're male, sperm cells. But they form reproductive cells. Well, there's no sperm or egg here. The reproductive cells here are spores. So when meiosis takes place, spores are going to be made. And just like a sperm cell or an egg cell, the spores are haploid, right? Now, meiosis, just like it does inside of humans, meiosis creates different genetic combinations than the parents, right? Kids do have some common features to their parents, but they don't look exactly like them. Meiosis infuses through crossing over and, and the different combinations of chromosomes that can be passed on through the reduction. It brings about a higher degree of genetic variation. So the spores of this that are produced here of this process are different than the ones that were originally released here. So we had the green mushroom that gave us the green hypha, right? would have been formed from green spores. Well, now the spores that are resulting from, well, partially from that green hypha are different than this parent. So these spores have a different genetic content than the, the, this parent had, all right? The spores then will grow, right? Because a spore is a single cell like this, and it will grow and form a hyphae. And that hyphae will reproduce more and more and more through mitosis. It will grow and form the mycelium. Only this time the mushroom would be orange, indicating it has a different genetic background or a different genetic content than the original mushroom. So I'll leave that up there for a second, all right? And the reason we would go sexual here, so this is our sexual pathway, is that life is tough. Right? There is a set of environmental conditions that these things are trying to live in that really is challenging it. And it's realizing, well, I'm really, really struggling as it is. And if I just keep making more of me exactly the same, all my offspring will struggle, and I don't want that. So what it will do is it'll employ this method. It's a little bit more complex, but it will share DNA with a neighboring mushroom and say, hey, I do have some good qualities about me. You've got some good qualities about you. Maybe together we can form offspring that will have amazing qualities that will find life you know, in these harsh conditions to be a little bit more tolerable, or maybe even be pretty good at surviving in it. All right, so I would rather this diagram, right? I'd rather this diagram than the one that is in your PowerPoint. All right, so I do apologize for that, but this is a great diagram, very simple, I think. I, I tried to simplify it as best I could, but that's it. Again, if you have any comments or questions about this, Ask the question in the comments section of the YouTube video or use Edsby. Probably Edsby would be the better way to get me. Use Edsby and ask your questions. All right. So we'll bring this, we'll erase this. So you can always pause the video and get this down into your notes. I'm going to erase it really quickly here and we'll move on with our lecture. So that's the toughest part of the lecture. And if you understood that a bit, you know, if you got a pretty decent understanding, then, then you're off to the races here. There's, the rest of this stuff should be pretty easy. So I'm going to bring this back down into here. All right. So there's our notes there. 
this diagram not a great diagram we're not going to really use that one so we'll get rid of it all right classification how are fungi classified well i'm not really too worried about this i put it in there um how we classify them of course goes back to physical structures and features and it's what they carry their spores in so where are the spores made where are they released from so there are case-like fungi there are sac-like fungi and club-like fungi. Um, the one that I drew, the one that you see in the ground quite often, that is this third one. It is a club-like fungus, all right? Uh, they're also known as imperfect fungi. Uh, there are also imperfect fungi that are out there that have no known sexual phases. Um, many of them, they cause disease in plants and animals. Um, we're not too worried about them. I mean. We don't want to get sick, but we won't be studying too much about them and the rest of the way. So for the remainder of the lecture, I've got some interesting fungi here that I thought, you know, impact human life in some way or are pretty interesting. The first one is penicillium. So here are some fungal cells and they're growing. And penicillium was being studied in a lab, right? Or actually, no, it wasn't penicillium that was being studied in a lab. It was bacteria that were making people really, really sick. And what happened was... Somebody in the lab got the plates, um, what would the word be, contaminated with penicillium. So here's a bacterial smear, right? They would have gone into someone's throat that had this really bad bacterial infection, got a plate of agarose, it's a sugar compound, and smeared the bacteria. So the bacteria would be growing all in this track right here. This is a colony of bacteria. Somebody, by mistake, contaminated the plate with penicillium, all right, a fungus. You can see penicillium is growing here. And so on the plate, we see this. There's our plate. Here's the penicillium here, and we can see the original smear of the bacteria. But an interesting thing happened is that the bacteria wouldn't go anywhere around the penicillium. So we had this buffer zone in here, all right? We had this area here that had bacteria in it, but now it didn't. It was totally devoid of any bacteria. And so at first you're probably thinking, you know, some kids work in your lab, oh look, look Jimmy, you went and contaminated the plates. And then as you're looking, thinking now I gotta throw this out, you're going, wait a second here. This bacteria is killing all the people in our town. Whatever this is, makes a chemical that kills a bacteria. If this chemical is safe for us to take, that could be a good thing. And of course, you probably already have this figured out, penicillium is the source of penicillin. In fact, we get several antibiotics that are formed from fungi, right? So penicillin is a very important thing. And it was found by a mistake. Can you believe that? Sometimes it happens. Here's trichophyton. Now, trichophyton is microscopic. It's very, very small. But you may have heard of it before, right? Trichophyton causes a condition called athlete's foot. Now, I know the picture's small on my YouTube video, but you can zoom it up on your, uh, on your iPad or your computer. Athlete's foot is, it goes into place, it's found in places where there are showers, warmth and moisture because that's what it thrives on and what it does is it sticks to your feet as you walk in the shower so if you don't have your shower flip-flops or sandals on and you walk in you can get this stuff stuck to your feet and you're thinking wait a second sir earlier on you said it was a sap robe and it ate dead and decaying material I'm alive I'm not dead so why is it eating my feet remember the outer layer of your skin is dead cells and that's what these things are feeding on and what happens is your skin becomes very very red irritated and it itches like crazy it feels really hot and you itch it all the time so that's called athlete's foot here are lichens lichens are these crusty looking things found on the rocks here they actually help to break down rocks and form rocks into soil so that's a very important thing because if soil can here's some more lichens if soil is formed that lets plants grow. And we don't eat fungi for a whole lot. Of, you know, we don't gain a whole lot of nutritional value from fungi. But we do from plants. And these lichens help form 
soil from the rocks. They break them down. This is a bracket fungus. You've seen these. I, I When I lived in Pickering, I used to drive my bike through the Rouge Valley, and you'd see bracket fungus. This is an old tree. It's dying or it's dead. And you can see the bracket fungus has moved in to feed on the tree. There's another one there. You can see this tree got knocked down. It's kind of arched over this way. It got knocked down in the storm, and it's died. It's been uprooted, so now the fungus is moving in there to feed on it. Here's some mushrooms in your lawn. You've seen these ones before, these little brown mushrooms. And there's insects and grubs and worms and various other creatures that die within your lawn. And these things, they absorb that organic matter. Here's some mushrooms here. These mushrooms are the ones that when people talk about, you know, the, the drug type of mushrooms that have hallucinogenic effects, that's these ones right here. All right, so they take, they have a chemical inside of them that is hallucinogenic. It makes your brain think it's seeing and experiencing things it's not. And here's a rare type of mushroom. Not all mushrooms do this, only a few species, that is bioluminescent. So what happens is it, it produces chemicals in its cells that emit light when they are mixed together, right? Kind of like a glow stick, only the glow stick is chemiluminescent. This is bioluminescent because it's inside of living cells. Same as a firefly and other types of bacteria and things like that. This thing here produces its own light. You would have learned about bioluminescence in gray ten in your optics unit. And, of course, you know what grinds my gears when people use that lame fungi joke when talking about mushrooms. I probably have used that joke lots. But, um... That concludes our talk about fungi. I uh, hope you hope I was clear and you understood everything. So if there are any questions, get through to me on Edsby. And uh, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the talk. See you soon.